Hello everyone. Just waiting to um, have Layla join us. I've been really excited to talk about um, Bird Summons with uh, the author herself, with Layla. Um, we all met yesterday, Leeds Lit Club, to discuss the book. So it's going to be fun to discuss it with Layla herself now. I can see Layla is here. Let's see if I can get her to join. There we are. Ah, there you are. Hello. 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 Oh. Oh, we'll have to keep you up, right? Yeah. I have to keep you up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I need. I need to lift it a bit more, okay? <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at my own, thinking maybe I should lift mine, but I think I'll be okay. Oh. Maybe you need to lower your. No, it's the other way around. Yeah. I need to actually to, to, to drop it. It always does that. You know, you set yourself up perfectly, but when you start to share the screen, you end up moving around, it's and then you have of... to readjust again. Okay. <laughs> there you are. That's this is the lowest I've ever done. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Oh, okay. well, we can see you that's the important thing how are you keeping that's you the important well? thing fine fine oh well nice to see you too you. yeah I was really excited for today actually because I'm a bit of a well yeah I'm a bit of a fan girl I'm not gonna I'm not even going to pretend it's any other way um so thank yeah. you I know we love it actually we read the minaret quite a few years ago now um book club oh no. yes oh gosh I think maybe maybe even four years ago now um and we absolutely loved it and I especially loved it because you know where it was set Regent's Park you just captured all of that okay. so beautifully and then oh. I recently read The Kindness of Enemies and that's just become one of my favorite reads of 2021 already I just know it's going to be a difficult one to to top I loved that <laughs> and uh, yeah so it's been wonderful. I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to talking to you. But today is obviously we're talking about bird summons. Um, I'm just going to remind okay. everybody who's joining us that they can leave comments as we go along and I'll try and bring them in whenever I can. And there's, if you're on your phones, you'll see a little question mark at the bottom of the screen. You can put questions in there for Leila at any point as well. Um, and you can ask about other books as well. That's absolutely fine. It doesn't have to be about bird summons. Um, so yeah, everybody can get, um, get, get involved in the conversation. This is nice. There's a nice comment here already. Um, book Blabberer has said that the translator is so far their most favorite book. So that's wonderful. Oh, that's good. Nice. To, to start the conversation. <laughs> I'll just introduce you, Leila, to everybody. Um, Layla Abu okay. Layla was uh, Abu Layla. So, do you know I've been calling you Layla Abu Layla until I went on your website and I saw the Arabic and I was like, oh no, no, this that's not right. That's, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Layla Abu Layla was born in Cairo, grew up in Khartoum, and moved in her mid twenties to Aberdeen in Scotland. Um, she is the author of five novels. Bird Summons the Translator was was um, a New York Times one hundred Notable Books of the Year. Uh, the Kindness of Enemies, Minaret, and Lyrics Alley, uh, which was a fiction winner of the Scottish Book Awards. Layla was the first winner of the Kane Prize for African Writing, and her latest story collection, Elsewhere Home, won the Satire Fiction, Saltire, sorry, Saltire Fiction Book of the Year Award. Layla's work has been translated into 15 languages, and she was long listed three times for the Orange Prize for Fiction. Her plays, The Insider, The Mystic Life, and others were broadcast on BBC Radio, and her fiction included um, in publications such as Freeman's, Gradta, and Harper's Magazine. I mean, that's incredible, Leila. And I didn't even realise that you'd, you'd been translated into 15 different languages. That's incredible. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Could you um, sort of maybe introduce for uh, viewers who haven't read Bird Summons, um, Okay. A little bit about the story and how you came to writing it. Okay, so um, uh, Bird Summons is three um, Muslim women who wrote trip in 
in the, to the Scottish Highlands uh, to visit the grave of uh, Lady Evelyn Cobold. And uh, the three women, uh, they are very different, although they, they all uh, um, belong to their Arabic-speaking um, Muslim women's group in Dundee. And um, the, 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 the part of the novel is a road trip examining the, the, the issues that they have in their life and how their lives connects with other, with their home, homelands. You know, they're still, um, they're, they're, they're actually all immigrants. They're, the three of them have been uh, born abroad and, and they came here. So there's they're three, they're three immigrants and they're all still connected with their life abroad. And um, and then um, when they go on the way, they stop um, and they have like a little holiday uh, near the near the Loch Ness, and it's there that uh, that they begin to kind of have uh, mystical experiences, and uh, and and things start to go a little, a little bit sort of strange and and and, and surreal. The po- Part of this uh, mystical experiences is the appearance of the hoopoo a burl, bird who tells uh, Iman uh, stories and, and, and fables that the, the bird mixes from Middle East sources as well as Scottish uh, sources. So there's this part of the novel involves a lot of these uh, folk tales that are fused together from the Middle East as well as the, 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 the Scottish. Mm. So that's that's about it. Um, I think with this book, it's different than my other books because of the magical realism elements, and it's also different because I um, I did uh, write it very much. Um, um, to be honest, uh, after uh, the kindness of enemies, which was my previous novel, I had a lot of high hopes for the kindness of enemies. I I, I um, uh, and I was kind of disappointed when uh, when when uh, publication came. I felt it didn't it didn't get enough attention as I thought it would be. It wasn't received as as well as I wanted it uh, to, to be. And so, so I kind of felt like, oh well, nobody's reading. Nobody. I could say what I like. Who cares? I had this kind of uh, ch- kind of almost childish <laughs> attitude of like. Um, well, it's not childish. No, no. Let's not. No, no. Let's not say child. It's actually freeing, yeah. and I think that 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 is actually a, one of the good things about not being in the limelight, about not being, um, you know, um, out there. You know that you know the book that's on the 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 the, the shortlist and the book that's winning, and uh, you know you kind of uh, get more freedom because then you're you're being read by the people who want to read you genuinely. You're not. People aren't picking up your book because mm-hmm. it's the book that everybody has to read. They're picking it up genuinely. So I, I felt the kind of free that I could do what I wanted. I could write what I want. And I so I wrote something that was very personal, very, uh, very much the kind of book that I would like to read, mm. um, rather than uh, what I, sh- I, you know, what I rather than it would be good to write that more than more. It was kind of what I wanted to read in a kind of a private uh, way. Mm -hmm. And the first draft I I submitted to my publishers, um, they weren't happy with it. They weren't happy with it because it was, it was very much, very dreamy, very all over the place. The women were, there was no uh, Lady Evan Cobalt at all in the first draft. It was just that the three of them were going on a holiday uh, they didn't even come from countries. I didn't even say whether where they came from, the women, because in the first draft it didn't seem to me to matter. Um, and and so in the second draft, then all these things started to 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 come uh, together. And uh, the, the, because one of the questions uh, I was asked was why are they going on this trip? Uh, you know, what's the purpose of the trip? And then. Uh, the the idea of the of visiting the lady Evelyn's grave came mm. came to me. Yeah, <laughs> I'm so shocked at um, your experience of the kindness of uh, enemies because that was a beautiful book and I feel like now I'll have to go on a big campaign to make sure people are reading it. But I mean, I guess the gift, <laughs> the gift is that you felt you know that you felt free to be able to write then whatever you want. And bird summons is very different, isn't it? It it feels like a 
a real shift in your not only the writing because you bring in magical real realism but I was talking about this last night with the with the club <laughs> with uh, Lee's Lit and I was saying that I felt that what was really different about this book as opposed to your other books perhaps is that although spirituality and Islam and faith is really important in pretty much all of all of your books um it felt like the focus of identity or that aspect of identity in this book was far more internal and far more yeah. about what is rooted within us than what's rooted outside of us um so yeah i mean i felt like bird summons i we can see your liberation in that, <laughs> if you like in that, in that sense but i also want to pick up what um tasneem um masarwe has written in the comments she said for the record the kind enemies was so well researched and it was an amazing read and book blabber said it was serious literature loved it historical fiction is at my favorite and that book is way up there so i hope that you know the reading community will circle back to to your previous book as well because it's certainly worth um a read it's a beautiful stunning book but also Thank bravo you. to your uh publishers <laughs> <laughs> or making you think about where these three women are going to go and to enter um Evelyn Zainab Cobbold into the story because that was for me that was such an educational aspect of your book so we know obviously you know central to the book is the road trip and we've got Salma and Moni and Iman um and they're essentially traveling to another part of Scotland to go and visit the grave of Lady Evelyn Zay Zainab Cobbold who is of course a historical person right she lived she was around yeah. historical uh, information about her but this was the first time I had ever heard about her and I just loved how your book set me off on this you know big mm. google dive and I wanted to learn more about her and there's something that Salma says in the book she says she worshiped as we worshiped so she kept her own culture wore edwardian fashion shot deer and left instructions for bagpipes to be played at her funeral <laughs> she is the mother of scottish islam and we need her as our role model how did you um first learn about her yourself and what was the significance for you in making these three muslim women essentially almost go on a kind of a pilgrimage to her to her grave um you know and and the significance of of these muslim women from diverse backgrounds going to to visit this um, edwardian muslim woman Yeah, I I don't remember where I first heard about her exactly, but I wrote her name uh in my phone. So I have a I have a you know you everybody has notes on on their mm -hmm. phone and I kind of wrote her name and I write sometimes if uh, if something catches my interest and I think oh well maybe later on um I can um I can do something about that or I could research that for a story or something like that. I do I do write that in my in my phone and sometimes it's a, it's a painting sometimes it's you know uh, it's just something that you know that uh, and usually at the time I'm working on something else and so I really can't do as you said I can't google her I can't uh, you know I can't go in that direction but but it just it, it rings a bell and says oh yeah yeah that that is something that would one day be of interest to me so I did have her on 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 the phone and so uh, on written down the name and so when this rejection from the publishers took place and I was, of course I was like reeling oh my god they don't like the book they don't what am I going to do I have to rewrite it I, and 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 all that and and, and to, to save the book and then suddenly one day this lady Evelyn popped into my mind and it was like oh that's it she's going to rescue the the novel yeah. from this uh, it was almost like having on your plate all this uh, kebab and 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 uh, green be green uh, peppers and stuff and she was the skewer you know you should oh, put everything that. in the skewer so I love that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so suddenly it was like wow i've got i'm going to have i'm going to have it all neat in, on the plate you know and yeah. it's not going to be you know all over the place it's going to have it's going to be all neat and um and so i google then at that point i started to google her and then i found this incredible description of the of the imam from the walking mosque mm. saying that he was this it just went straight inside me the the the, the story of how he was uh, you know he he gets this phone call late at night and and uh, 
that he's told he hears this Scottish boy saying there's this woman who died and she wants to be mm. she want they want an imam and and he goes on the night train and it takes him you know forever to get to the highlands and he describes it as you know it's just so far it's like going from Karachi to Lahore yeah. <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and it's just it, this kind of all you know really captured captured my imagination and uh, so I really did then I got her book and I started reading her book and, and you know I kind of went very much into that and I wasn't sure at first whether I was gonna incorporate her story as a kind of historical or whether I would have her voice or whether you know there was a lot of kind of decisions that I had to 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 to, to make but but then I felt that yes I mean this is the, the the first draft had very had very much them connecting to the land. This idea of them praying in places where nobody has ever prayed, and 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 and, and going around and reading Quran and 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 uh, kind of connecting to the landscape. And uh, and so I thought, yeah, she she's so symbolic of that, that, that of of the place, you know, of um, of Islam being something uh, uh, spiritual, that, that a way of worshiping God anywhere it doesn't it's not tied to uh, the, the 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 inner city it's not tied to you know a, a, a certain ethnicity uh, the mosque all this she she had nothing to do with that and that's one of the things that people criticize her for because that she did but but i can see it from her point of view that she uh, it would have been patronizing for her you know there she's this aristocrat to kind of pretend that she's one of these uh you know immigrants or one of these these people so she just actually stayed where she was which is a dignified uh, re response mm. so um uh i i like that i like all that about about her about her her life yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah and i, I like i love that i thought she was a, a great sort of um symbolic character i mean i didn't think about it when i was reading it um but you don't give her a voice actually in the in the book um, mm. and actually to to keep her there just sort of as a, a ghostly presence was um yeah more powerful perhaps than than making her speak in any uh, overt way i mean we have her words through letters um mm. she's written, but not yeah there's no point i mean there was a point when um i, mean, I don't want to give away too many spoilers but you know obviously someone does get to the grave um, <laughs> and when they do <laughs> I, I did wonder if she was going to hear a voice from the grave or something like that. But it was nice that that didn't happen, that actually what this individual saw was their own future. Um, and so you really keep that uh, theme of continuity so that, you know, Islam isn't something alien or even Salma, Moni and Iman, who have come from different countries, none of them are alien, that, you know, this sort mm. of universal human connection that you keep um, sort of in the present, uh, you know, connected to the past and into the future. It was all very beautifully done, um, very well balanced. Um, so what I was going to ask you next was about each of the characters. Um, they really sort of mm. break away from stereotypes that we all know exist and are so tired of now about Muslim women. Um, but in subtle and non-sensational non ways, right? You, you, you don't sensationalize. Sometimes in, the, in breaking the stereotypes, we end up in, a, a, in an ironic kind of way, sensationalizing the, the original stereotype. Um, but you do it really subtly and in, in ways that, you know, are really familiar to a Muslim readership. You know, like, you know, there's du'as that they make, you know, when they start their journey yeah. or when, you know, um, or when they you know sort of start to eat or whatever it may be um but i wanted to know from your perspective out of salma moni and iman was there one who you related to a bit more or who you maybe not so much related to but more that you enjoyed writing more than the other they're all quite complex in their own little ways aren't they mm -hmm. I would say, like, they're all bits of myself. I would say, <laughs> I would say I'm like 50% money, 40% Salma, 10% Iman. I would probably, that's probably how it is. <laughs> and so, um, Moni was the one I was very, I was the most comfortable writing about. Mm -hmm. she, she seemed to me very, very clear, and her dilemma was very, sort of, very clear cut uh, to, to, to me. I could re uh, see her very. 
clearly. And, she, and she's the one who's Sudanese, so of course I, I related to her in, in, in that way. Um, uh, uh, Iman intrigued me. I was very intrigued by her, and I, I was like very curious about her. Um, so I enjoyed very much writing about her, uh, the bird, and and all this kind of magical stuff. She's the one who gets all the 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 the, the, hoop, the hoopoo, all the magic sort of gets goes to 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 Iman. So I was kind of like very much. Um, in, in, in intrigued by by her and with Salma Salma was very much the kind of the beginning of the book for me it started with Salma it started with the the, the idea of her um, uh, getting this message on Facebook from this old boyfriend you know and the, the her fr flirting with with him I think we've lost you became big and um, and so one of the things I wanted to do after writing a historical novel was to kind of go back into the presence and, and for me the presence represented very much this uh, the social uh, you know um, media and and and, uh, and and a lot of writers I think at the time were doing that there's a lot of books had included Twitter and included people you know, doing things on, on, on Twitter. But, but I wanted to do this idea of, of how Facebook suddenly made me and a lot of people suddenly connect with people we hadn't seen for ages. And suddenly every day we were like, oh, well, let's search. You know, me and my husband were like, let's, let's search for so-and-so, let's search for so-and-so. And suddenly you would find these people and you'd see photos of them. And it was kind of like really, really amazing for, for our generation. I know the younger generation it's all natural for them. <laughs> but for us, it was like really uh, exciting. And uh, so it's, um, I think the novel started off with that, started off with this, the, the, the issue of Salma uh, flirting with, with Amir. And uh, I, I did think of him actually coming physically to, to Scotland to meet her or not. And, uh, you know, there, that was uh, of great interest uh, to me. Yeah, <laughs> I, I like that. You know, you, you kept all of them um, complicated, and you know there was a little bit of, you know, the scandalous. You know, the slightly scandalous. Mm. You don't imagine a Muslim woman <laughs> speaking to. Well, first of all, having an ex-boyfriend, um, but then speaking to him online and and having you know desires and you know it, it, you know you know you just don't associate that with the with the nice good muslim lady and you know so it was it was kind of yes. freeing as well to see that that you know yeah actually you know what muslim women come in and in all shapes and sizes with all sorts of desires and you know are fallible as well you know can can make mistakes and learn and move forward with them too right so that was really um great to see as well it's a little bit of complex and unexpected representation of of muslim women as well and i like that well yeah go ahead no, I would argue that it's the opposite. I think that this, okay. these kind of things are going, are going, are are uh, are very prevalent in Muslim countries uh -huh, yeah. because because in conservative societies, people have less less of a chance of 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 um, um, you know taking these things to their logical conclusion of meeting and and and, and all that. So a lot takes place within this. Uh, world of, of 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 social media and within this secret, you know, w within this space, let's mm. call it well, maybe the courtship space or something like that. Mm. So I would say that that in 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 a lot of Muslim countries, um, there is a lot going on in 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 that sphere. Mm. Uh, maybe more than than in the West, where people don't spend so much space time in this area they move quickly they would move rather quickly mm -hmm. uh to to meeting up and 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 they wouldn't spend so much time on this on this uh fl fl flirtation yeah. so um i don't know it's, it's the book is going to come out in arabic uh mm -hmm. soon so i'll see what the reaction will be when it's published in beirut and you know read in sudan and, and places like that I'll, in egypt i'll see how it would people yeah, it, yeah, that would be very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we touched a little bit on how you intertwine um, folk stories from 
Arab and Persian as well as from Scottish heritage into the story through magical realism, which first appears through the arrival of the hoopoe bird. Um, I loved the magical realism. I know that uh, Leeds Lit Club was a little bit 50-50 split and some just didn't know what to make of it at all. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, I personally loved um, the magical realism and the fables were so enriching, um, filled with morals and lessons. Uh, uh, actually, even in fact, this morning over breakfast, I was telling um, my family over breakfast one of the stories, my favourite story, which was the one about the camel, the lion, the crow okay. um, and the jaguar. I loved that story. Yes. That was probably my favourite one. But I wanted to ask you, actually, um, if you could talk to us a little bit about, about why you decided to use magical realism in the way that you did. Um, I think at the big, I, I, I uh, had this idea that they would go to this place, which is a real place, this, this place near Loch Ness. And there is a monastery there. It's, it's, it's now called the Highland Club. It's been made into, into like flats and stuff. It's no, it's no longer a, a monastery, but, uh, it is, it is a real, it is a real, uh, it is a real place and it's really very atmospheric and, and they, because they've kept the old building. And so you get the stained glass windows, you get, it's it's really as it's as it's described in, in in the novel. It is it does look like that. So I wasn't sure. I wanted them like to have a kind of a mystical experience because I went. One of the things that they described was something that I had encountered when I went to this place. Uh, this this room where they had the the rectory and uh, I did feel a kind of uh, I had a feeling when I went in, into the room. I, I kind of felt something. And then when I, um, more than in any other place, so it was like if I'm, if I'm walking around that I'm trying to measure, not measure, or, you know, to feel a pulse in the whole monastery, this was the place which had the greatest, um, you know, sensation mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I tried to find out more about it, and it turned out that the monks who lived in this, um, in this monastery they used to pray before they 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 uh, they had someone. One of them would be praying continuously while they were eating, mm. you know. And it was a very uh, very important part of their um, of their worship of the of the rituals. This prayer that was connected with with the meal because this was a place where they they ate, and then one of them would be would be praying. And so uh, I felt very much that this was a place where somebody had prayed very, you know, very genuinely, very deeply a long, 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 long time ago, of course. So I wanted to put that in the novel somehow, and, and, but I wasn't sure how to, 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 to convey that, you know, in a, in a novel. How do you speak about things like that? Do you show, do they have to see a ghost? Do they have to, I mean, the, the, it was... It was it was difficult to 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 write about something something like that. Mm -hmm. So then this idea of the of the hoopoo came and the stories and I don't know how how that came where that came from. But as I was saying to you, it was just written kind of very um, uh, dreamlike. But that was all in the first draft, and the publishers were all happy with that. So that never was, that was never contested at all. Mm -hmm. It was just um, uh, that the first draft of the novel didn't have the Lady Evelyn, didn't, it was, it didn't have a reason for them to, 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 to go. So, uh, so I was surprised then, yeah, when, when the novel was published and a lot of people were not, were kind of like, it was kind of mixed reaction to do with the, with the magical realism and... Uh, and some people from the beginning were like, oh, no, no, I'm not going to read a book where a, hoop, a bird speaks. No way. You know, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I don't want, I don't want that. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's just, a, um, it's just whether it's your cup of tea or, or you're in the mood for it at a certain time or, or, or something like that, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I loved it. And I've got this lovely comment here um, in, in the comments that says you are a genius combining magical realism, historical fiction, and folk tale together. And I Thank have to you. agree. Um, and somebody else has written, Sophia reads, she's written, I absolutely love the magical realism and the combination of Arab and Scottish folklore, which was fabulous. Um, somebody is asking if you know if uh, Bird Summons or indeed any of your books will be made available in Saudi Arabia? Oh, I don't know about that. 
I think they should, some of them should be, some of them should be. I know that bird summons was, uh, um, the censors were looking at it. Everything that, every book that enters Saudi Arabia has to pass through, through the censorship. And I thought that having passed the first time with my first novels, I'd be automatically, um, you know, <laughs> put on the green list. But it, <laughs> but it seems that every book I write, has to has to uh, has to go oh, through the process yeah. yeah so hopefully it passes Inshallah, yeah um, so staying on the theme of these fables and folklores what, is there one in the book that you've used that was like the first one or your favorite one do you have a favorite amongst them um do i have the favorite um, amongst them uh, they were all ones that meant a lot to me. Like I'd be reading a lot and then, uh, oh yeah, I really like that. I really get that. And so I would, I would, I would use uh, that, that one, the one that I, that I got. The, there was one that wasn't actually a fable. It was, um, it was more religious. It was more um, what they call, um, uh, I forgot the name in Arabic. Uh, Israeliyat. Oh yeah. So, what? Yeah. You know, you so this was about. I don't know if this translates it. Like it comes from the Jewish tradition or from the the religious uh, tra tradition. So it was to do with the Prophet uh, Moses, mm -hmm. alayhi salam, that he asked Allah Almighty uh, uh, about justice. He wanted to understand justice. And then the the story he he hears is the story of the guy who. Uh, who comes to make wudu and then he leaves the money belt and then the the child comes and takes the money belt and then this this story um, uh, was I felt it felt special to me it felt more loaded because it wasn't really a fable it was it had this really deep um, you know uh, 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 kind of religious it came from a religious uh, source and it came also it interested me that 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 the the, the, the you know, Moses, Moses salam, was also uh, wanting to understand this, this, this thing of justice, which a lot of modern people nowadays have this mm -hmm. feeling, you know, why, why does COVID exist? Or mm -hmm. why a lot of people find this difficult to, to understand. And so this story goes through all these three characters, the old, the elderly man, the knight, the, and, and it explains, you know, what it, on the surface it looks it looked like, oh, this is terrible that the boy stole the money. Oh, this is terrible that the knight killed the old man. And but then there's a there's a there's a logic behind it that mm. we don't know about. Mm. The other story that I really loved was the one about the the frozen snake. So that the snake catcher um, catches the snake in the snow. He finds this huge snake. And uh, he's, the, the snake is frozen, and so he, he takes it with, his, with the ice and everything, and he brings it down to the village, and he shows off, and he says, look, I've captured this, uh, this snake. But then by the time he's brought it to the village, and by the time he's set it up, the ice has melted, and the snake is actually alive, and he yeah. <laughs> eats the catcher. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. no, I think that was my favorite, yeah. yeah. You know what I really loved was that you delivered these moral stories, these stories mm. laden with moral um, lessons, but you never moralize. You know, you're not, you're not preaching through these lessons. And in fact, it's really open-ended. It's for the reader to make up their mind as to what these stories mean. So I said to you earlier that the, the story of the camel was my favorite one. Yeah. And this morning, I, you know, relayed the whole story to my family. And they were, and I, and I ended it with, so what's the moral, guys? What's the moral of the story? And all of them started giving their own opinions, like, you know, what's the story from, you know, what, sorry, what's the moral from what happened to the camel? What's the moral from what the lion did? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm laughing because I can see my husband's put a comment in the question saying, <laughs> why did the lion turn away? You don't have to answer that. I said to him, the point is for you to figure that out. <laughs> you know? Um, but I love that. I love that, you know, everyone can make, everyone can take their own lessons from it. And I think that's what's really valuable. Mm. It's the sort of book you can return to um, 
because it will have a different meaning each time you read it. And I have to say, I read it first time end of last year, and I read it again this week in preparation for today and for our book club's meetup yesterday. And I really, really appreciated the book so much more on my oh, second read, because um, yeah. I knew what was coming. In, in, you know, yeah. knowing what happens in the story doesn't actually... Um, you know, dampen the experience of the story a second time round. You know, with some books, they're so heavily plot driven that if you know the plot, mm. the, you know, there's nothing left of the journey. But even knowing mm. the plot of the story um, didn't, uh, it, it didn't impact on my second read in a negative way. I really mm. enjoyed it. In fact, I felt like I pulled out sort of more hidden gems that I didn't necessarily get the first time round. Um, That's good. So there are lots of themes, lots of themes in the book that you cover so beautifully, so lyrically. Lots of people have been commenting on just how beautifully, uh, you know, you, you pen your, your words and your stories. Um, you've covered themes like friendship, belonging, self-knowledge and so much more. But what really struck me quite deeply, and I think this was the theme that we probably stuck to the most last night in our conversation as well, mm. was the theme of motherhood, um, particularly through Moni, um, about whom you write, you know, she sort of spits her life as before his birth and after his birth. That was her life, split right in the middle. Um, and then you go on and you write the steepest learning curve. Oh, yes, getting an MBA had been much easier. Standing up to male colleagues at work, a doddle in comparison. <laughs> all her resources, all her intelligence were needed to be a mother to Adam and not let that role floor her. And in the meantime, she let herself go. Weight gain and no time to cut her toenails, to moisturize her elbows or buy deodorant when it ran out. Sleep became a treat, a nap. Um, the only gift she wanted. I mean, that was very relatable. I remembered that. I remembered that from, you know, early days of having children as well. You know, you just want sleep. Um, but through Moni, you give a, a really, um, I felt refreshingly honest, actually, depiction of motherhood. You know, how we set ourselves up by aiming only for perfection. I mean, my friend, um, the marvelous medic she is on Instagram she often talks about you know superwoman syndrome how women are put on this pedestal but we also then try to attain that level of perfection every single day and end up essentially burning ourselves out um and that's like I think quite a universal experience but also through Salma and Iman you give us sort of an insight into another perspective so Salma laments having uh, in some ways, you know, raise children in a country where it's okay, mm -hmm. even expected to be rude to your parents, but it's frowned upon to be rude to your waiter. I mean, that was one of those insights where I, was like, <laughs> I think my mum has had that thought plenty of times as well. Um, yes. And then Iman observes, and this really got to me as well, you write um, how one mother could look after 12 children and decades later, these 12 adults would fidget and struggle to look after that one mother. That gave me chills when I read that um, because mm. it's, it's such a true depiction of what, what happens mm. too often. Um, so there seems to be a cultural gap as well in constructions of motherhood that each character highlights. Could you talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, what, what you were playing with, what you were exploring um, with regards to motherhood in Bird Summons? I didn't think about it as, a, as like a separate theme. It just came naturally with, with, with them. I mean, I knew the Moni story that was central to her, that, you know, that she, she had this disabled child and that she was, you know, really happy with how uh, the kind of medical treatment he was getting in Britain and uh, she didn't want to uh, accompany her husband uh, 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 um, to Saudi Arabia because of, because of that. And um, I had seen this happen with women that sometimes when, you know, when they have the, the you know, disabled uh, children, they, they can't go beyond that. They, they kind of get... Um, uh, you know, they kind of get uh, stuck with that. And, and so I wanted in a way to, um, to show that side of it, that, that um, the kind of the neglect for the husband and how uh, the, 
she was she was actually not being fair on 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 the husband and try and get her out of that kind of slowly gently while at the same time um understanding why she was um you know she was she was being uh, like that and then with the the case of 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 Salma it was the children growing up that was that was leading part of her feeling of alienation that she was beginning to feel um uh, that they were not like her they were not um and this is very much an immigrant thing that that you the, the, there's a huge difference in um in in first and second generation immigrants and in a, in a way i think i said that in another in another story that that the the immigrant kind of like gives their children up for adoption almost it's almost as if uh your own child is being brought up by the school is being brought up by the society and and so um you're sharing your child now with with all these strangers the the the, the child is not only listening to you mm-hmm. and even if some parents can be um uh you know they're very strict or whatever the some of these children they're just they just put a barrier they'll tell the parent what the parent wants to hear mm-hmm. and then they have their own thoughts and 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 so on uh based on what is around them which is real this is their real life uh, is what is around them rather than what the parent is is is, is saying to them and i think that this is this is a huge subject i mean i could i could write i could go on writing about this for for forever it's it's mm-hmm. it goes beyond mothering because it's something that a father would also um would also ex- ex- experience yeah mm-hmm. yeah i i can so get that and i think that there's so much more that goes on isn't there there's um also sort of like the romanticizing of the motherland that takes place as well mm. and kind of the clinging on to traditions that back home they don't even cling on to anymore they've moved on but sort of the 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 generation that migrated sort of has crystallized at a particular point in its sort of traditional values exactly yeah. and the things yeah. that they hold dear yeah um there's another theme that you explore really beautifully and that's of sisterhood and friendship um so i'm i don't know if this is me being sadistic or something but I really enjoyed their bust up. So one week in the trip, <laughs> Salma Moni and Iman have this massive colossal fallout. Um I really giggled through that. I just I, I don't know, I think I, it was cuz I was like finally we're being real with each other, you know? I I was like, you know, yeah, they're getting it all out. You know, they fall out, they grow, they change. They do things that the others may not approve of, um but at the end of the day they're there for each other. And I feel like the big sort of lesson that they learn that I certainly came away from the book with is that they must support each other even if they have individual disagreements in order for them to have collective progress i felt that that was just such an important moral um and one that actually a lot of us could really do with with taking on board um was there anything in particular that moved you to write a story that has this moral at its at its core Uh, or was that just an unintended theme as well <laughs> but i mean was that something was there something particular that drove you to to that no but i i i understand uh, i mean i understand sisterhood as being um especially with, with if you're if you're if this is your muslim sister that you're you're helping each other on this spiritual path you're helping each other become uh, better muslims or or stay good muslims or you know um, manage this this the, uh, this journey this trial and and so uh, each of them has a different um you know um a different challenge a different a weakness mm. and so and and uh, and so and that's why they 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 have this fight because they're 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 both they're all saying well, you're doing wrong you're doing wrong you're doing wrong um but at, but at the same time they they're all wrong there isn't there isn't um you know um there isn't um uh, you cannot be perfect you cannot be sort of perfect and 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 so it is a matter of of uh, having the compassion to realize that um to like to understand that 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 uh, that your sister 
is tempted in that way. And, and even though you wouldn't, you wouldn't dream. I mean, someone like Moni would never dream maybe of, 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 of even talking to another man or looking at another man. But she has to get to the stage of understanding that this is something that Salma is going through. And this is something that she needs to support her in, 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 in getting, getting out of, in, in, in resisting. Mm -hmm. And um, so that is, that's what I wanted to, to, to do. Like, this is, this, is, this is what a real friend is. It's not just um, uh, a, a real friend is going to, um, um, you know, protect you from your own bad side. That is a real, that is a real friend and not the opposite. Not that, that, that you're saying, uh, I want to do this, that, and the other. And the friend is like fueling you into that direction. That then is, 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 is a bad friend. So they are, they are good friends mm. from a, from a, you know, from a, a Islamic point of, 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 of view, even though they might not be uh, particularly warm towards each other, or they might not have the same interests, or they might not, they might not fulfill other, um, you know, measures of friendship, but they, they, they do fulfill this uh, measure of, um, of, of, of sisterhood or, you know, um, and, and I think also that when we, uh, I remember reading um, about the, the brotherhood in Imam Ghazali's work. It's one, it's one of the, the beautiful things in the Ahya Ulum al Din, the revival of Islamic studies. This is one of the nicest sections where he describes this really close friendship that two men could have and how they would uh, be, you know, um, uh, he says they have to feel very comfortable with each other. They have to uh, feel comfortable uh, using the bathroom in each other's house. They have to, you know, things like that. They have to like pray together. They have to, I mean, he, he describes a lot of things of, of pointing out each other's faults and things like that. And so this is one of the occasions when, as, as women, you feel, well, what about us? What about our sisterhood? What kind of things do we go through? What kind of, um, you know, um, friendships do we, do, do we have? And we also need to support, uh, support each other. So that was one of the things I think that was going in, in my mind. Yeah. It's nice because it feels like they have a breakthrough, right? So at first, the, the argument feels like it's on a really superficial level of that's just wrong. OK, you can't do that because it's wrong. But they seem to break through a barrier where they it's no longer just saying that's wrong, but actually kind of getting behind behind the act itself or the desire itself to well, what's 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 causing this you know what's making you feel like you want to go towards this and then really kind of yeah. learning to and I think that's where friendship resides isn't it In, is being able to push a little bit further and just go a little bit deeper to see well what's behind this feeling what's underneath this sudden need that you've gotten that I don't agree with but I want to understand and I suppose that's where you yeah. allow them all to to land at is that this ability to um ha show enough compassion to be able to say okay no but why <laughs> you know why mm, why, yes. why this feeling let's yeah. talk about why this feeling I think yeah. that was a really great um aspect that you you show really well in in, in the book um so we've got a few questions here as well. So I do want to give you time for that, but yes. I'm going to ask a couple more questions of my own. And then, so I'm just going to remind everybody that if you do have questions um, and you've already written them down in the comments, I may have missed them. So please do put them into the question box that's down at the bottom and you'll see a little question mark. So put them in there or you can add them to the comments again now and I'll try and pick them up. So, but first my final question. Um, so you were born in Egypt, and as I said in the introduction, you, you grew up in Sudan, and then you moved later on in life to Scotland. And I read that in an earlier essay of yours that was entitled, And My Fate Was Scotland, which, by the way, I couldn't find. I couldn't find the original essay. I really wanted to, but I'd read that in, oh. in there, you had written about your move to Scotland, stating, I moved from heat to cold, from the third world to the first. I adjusted, got used to the change over time, but in coming to Scotland, I also moved from a religious Muslim culture to a secular one, and that move was the most disturbing of all, the trauma that no amount of time could cure, an eternal culture shock. I mean, I got that, I got that, because that, I mean, I really thought about my, my own mum <laughs> as well, um, in that moment, I could see that. Um, so what I was 
going to ask you was that, you know, that was written like two decades ago. Uh, and I wonder if there's been something therapeutic in your writing over the years as you grapple with the incongruences that, you know, a lot of Muslim women have to attend to, whether they were born here or not. Um, and as you also find the links that connect us humans to one another through shared histories and universal aspirations that transcend our apparent differences in your stories. Um, so I was wondering if through your writing, you've, you've managed to sort of uh, overcome this trauma in any way. And I ask, I ask that because, you know, I know that reading your books as a Muslim woman is very comforting. And you have this wonderful way of foregrounding, you know, our innermost thoughts and feelings and insecurities and questions and so many, because I'm talking beyond bird summons as well now. Um, and you do that without flattening us, you don't reduce us to a stereotype or, you know, to a paragon of piety. You know, you allow us these complexities. And there's a sentence in Bird Summons where you write, it was a continuation, a flow meandering, but not changing direction because, thy di because the direction had always been the same. The paths might be infinite, but the destination one. So I wonder if perhaps this is a trauma that you've processed now through your writing. Yes, thank you. That's a nice uh, question. Yeah, the, the article is in Wasa Theory. So I think it's, uh, they, don't have, they don't have it available on, um, I think you have to subscribe or something in order to get to the, the thing, but it's, it's, it, it should be in, in, in Wasa Theory. Um, I, you know, there was once a program uh, where they, they took a lot of uh, some young, a group of Muslims, young Muslims, and they showed them around an English village. They took them from the cities and they went around showing them these English villages. And they took them to a, like a cathedral, ancient cathedral. And then these young people were saying, well, the ones that they showed on TV were saying, oh, I don't feel I belong in this place. This has nothing to do with me. This is, I don't have any link to this history. And I was like horrified. How can you not see that, uh, that, that a long time ago people worshipped like Muslims that were worship, were, were, are, are worshipping now? How, how can you see that you're not, uh, how can you not see the connection, you know? And I think that this is what makes the trauma go, go, goes away, that if you, that if you see that you that the that, that, that you, you go beyond what you're seeing around you, the people around you who are uh, you know treat, who are very secular and who treat you as a as an outsider and who can't get over uh, the ethnic differences and the racial differences, and you try and connect with the worshippers who worshipped in, in 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 this in this country years and, and years ago, mm -hmm. you know very much very much like Muslims worship. They 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 believed in God. They they prayed. They accepted if their child died. They accepted that this child you know, um, you know uh, that Allah gave them this child and that the child is is is, is going back to, to Allah. The same the same the same as us. So why are we? Uh, feeling so why are we allowing us ourselves to feel so um you know so alien like we why why are we acting as if we are the weirdos no we no it's actually <laughs> it's actually the opposite you at this stage you've denied all your your ancestors mm -hmm. you know you're the ones who are acting very different than you than your your ancestors um and then you know maybe we are making you uncomfortable, reminding you of 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 your your ancestors. Perhaps that's what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but but so I think that that is 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 what you know um, can 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 make us go beyond this this uh, trauma and to and to and to feel that um, you know that that. The, 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 the land belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't belong to, to, to the people around us. Actually, the people around us uh, are, are themselves uh, moving. They're not the same people. They're, they, are, they are growing old and dying, of course, and, 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 and new people are coming in. And, and it's, it's, it, the population is, is moving. It's not the same uh, people. Mm -hmm. So um, if I arrived in this country, let's say, um, uh, 20, 30 years ago, and I had an, uh, an occasion where an elderly, or I was in my 20s, and, and, a, and a woman in her 60s shouted at me or abused me. 
where is she now? She's not alive. Mm -hmm. She cannot be. Mm -hmm. You know, she's most probably, let's say, she's, 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 she's most probably <laughs> safely to say that she has long gone. So, you know, you know what I mean? It's so why, I'm, why, why, why should I ever hold, hold a grudge? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, why, should I, why should I feel uh, hurt to, to, towards her? She's, she's gone. You know, she's long gone. And so um, I think that, that, is, that it is trying to see, some, trying to look at the bigger picture and, and, and not get so uh, hung up on, uh, you know, the, 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 the clashes that are happening now, the, the, the arguments that are going on, uh, that are going on at this particular uh, uh, moment mm -hmm. and trying to kind of like see... Uh, a much uh, a much bigger historical um, historical um, you know pic picture. Mm. So that's it. Yeah. <laughs> I actually picked out a quote from Bird Summons, which I'll end my bit on, and then before moving on to um, the questions from viewers, um, which I think ties in really nicely with what you've just said. Um, so at the end of the book, you write, "They had come to the loch." with their prayer mats and copies of the Quran, but they had not looked after them. They had not kept them safe. They had come to a country where people had stopped praying and not realized that they were the ones brought here to pray. They did not consciously take up the worship which others had left. They did not realize that they were a continuation needed to fill a vacuum awaited by the ancient forest and masses of rocks. They misunderstood their role. They underestimated their own importance and exaggerated their shortcomings. They inflated their problems and followed their egos, counseled each other, but rejected what was right. Their quarrels taking up space, their connections weakening, and now they were far away, deep in the realm of consequence. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> So let's get some questions from the good folks Thank that are you. with us today. Um, okay, I'm going to, let's see, where should we go first? Uh, I'll go from those who've been most patient with us. Um, okay, wait, hang on. I'm going to take this one because actually I'm interested in this as well. This is a comment that came up. We, we had some lengthy discussion about this um, in our conversation yesterday as a book club so somebody's asked if you could talk about Iman's avatar so you know she morphs into so I'm sorry so if you haven't read the book and you want to you may want to tap out of this conversation now because it is a bit of a spoiler um Iman becomes this strange creature which is a little bit yes. a little bit of a cow a little bit of a peacock and a little bit of a <laughs> lizard if I remember that correctly um yes and we all had our own well, we all had a big discussion on, on what that meant, but I'd like I'd like you to talk a little bit about if there was any symbolism in there, um, and then I'll tell you what we thought. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. That's good to know. I'm still not clear about her. She was always very sort of like intriguing for me, but I think she. It was, it was almost like she didn't want. But she and she had a lot of bad experiences to be, to be fair i mean she really was having a lot of bad experiences with all these men and stuff but she was almost like rejecting her humanity she was saying she used to say things like i want to be a tree mm -hmm. i want to be a sunset i want to be left alone i want like she didn't want uh she didn't want the burden of of being a human and being accountable and 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 and, and she just wanted to um, you know, she didn't want this, um, she didn't want the rules. She didn't want, you know, she didn't want Salma telling her what to do. And, and, and Moni is telling her, well, you don't have anyone in this country who's looking after you what, instead of appreciating the support you're getting. Why don't you, you know, but she, she, she doesn't want that. Mm. Um, it's, 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 it's not a very common I mean, it's not a. I mean, maybe they, maybe this was why people say it's not typical or it's not rep about it's not representative, or whatever. It's not a very common uh, fault that you see in people, mm -hmm. but 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 she seemed to have that this this uh, um, and part of her being beautiful and part of the way people objectified her beauty made her um, um, made her lean towards this. Um, 
sort of uh, a fault. Mm. And so she's not speaking. Part of the thing is that she loses her voice mm. and then she really wants to have that voice uh, back back again yeah so what did you say what did you so <laughs> quote we, say? We, were, we went a little bit more literal i think so, because if i remember correctly she was part cow part peacock and part lizard and so when we were talking yesterday i said oh i think the cow bit because there's a bit earlier in the book where she's walking down a path and um she thinks about how a cow sways as it yes goes. so i was like oh maybe <laughs> this is you know that maybe it's an allusion back to that because she was walking and maybe she was thinking for herself as a cow because she had this this um sort of disposition towards thinking oh, mm. like you said you know I'd like to be a tree or a bird or something else so maybe she felt for yes. a moment that she wanted to be a cow so that's where we thought the cow came in the peacock I thought was quite obvious you know peacocks sort of represent and symbolize beauty so maybe that was the reference yeah. of her beauty and the lizard I wasn't sure on and then so uh, um, another one of our book club members she said oh do you think it could be that she's like a chameleon because she's the one who's mm. sort of blending into her background and she keeps changing her outfits every day and she's playing with different sort of garments and um, she's almost role playing every single day. And yes. we were like, oh yeah, maybe that's what it was. And um, now that we're speaking um, and you mentioned that her, she loses her voice and I thought, I wonder if that was part of it that she'd focused and the people around her had focused so much on her beauty, on her outer appearance that you know she can't be heard but that maybe that's where that's what that's what she needed to strengthen was her voice mm. to find who she is and to to use her voice in a way that um you know demanded attention away just from her physical outer experience uh yeah from, you know yeah. beauty and things so that's what we thought <laughs> about that that's <laughs> that's where we went with that and I hope um book blabber has some closure now on on that issue <laughs> um <laughs> so let's take another question um someone has asked oh Michelle for now has asked what advice would you give to new writers Oh, okay. I'd say um, read a lot, which you are reading, obviously, a lot. I'd say uh, write first thing in the morning, which is difficult if you have young children. But uh, the, the fir there's, a, there's a very nice article um, on advice for writing by Will Self in The Guardian, which I've used. And he suggests that you write first thing in the morning before doing anything. And I do that before uh, putting on the Wi-Fi, before listening to the news, before talking to anybody, before, you know, doing anything. I, I write, you know, for an hour and I find that I produce a lot more than I would do uh, during the day. Uh, it just pours out of me. And then afterwards, during the day, I can edit and, and, and maybe write a little bit more. So it's getting this, um, um, you know, it's getting a flow, getting used to, to the words flowing out. And then after that, the, the, the words flow out. Then afterwards, you can then look at it and, and, and uh, critically and, and kind of change what you're writing and, 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 and so on and so forth. So I think that that, um, that is probably what, what you would, would be good advice and there's lots of opportunities to join workshops and things like that once you feel that you want to share your work and once you want to get um, feedback about your uh, work I think now nowadays there's a lot of opportunities for for for, for new writers um, but it's 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 balancing between seeking the opportunities and actually producing the the the, the work because you don't want to be uh, some people write something and then they send it out and then they just kind of like wait for a reply or they get um, inhibited. So it's a matter of also getting yourself to actually produce the, the, the writing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Sophia Reeds. She asks, um, the way you write about living in Scotland, oh, I'm trying to get the whole question up. Oh, I can't seem to get the whole question up. Um, Oh, that's a shame. It's completely different from the translator. Is that something? I don't I can't see the rest. Yeah. Uh, but let's say I'm guessing, I'm guessing that in the translator, the, the main character is very alienated. She's very homesick. She's, uh, everything is very strange for her. And that's because I wrote the translator 
um, years and years and years ago. Uh, you know, I was, I was, it was got it po- got published in ninety nine, so that was really a long time ago. And and so yes, in bird summons, it it, it does reflect. I'm more comfortable with being in Scotland and having lived in Scotland for such a long time. So there is a difference in um, uh, in, in in the attitude to to towards Scotland. It's no longer um, so alienating for mm. for me. Yeah, mm. Mm. that's lovely. It's nice to be able to see your own journey through your own books. Um, as well, yes, it is yeah. actually. Yes, <laughs> I'm going to make this the last question because I realise we have gone over. Um, our time but I, I mean this was a question I was going to ask you as well is about your next book and what you are working on now so Gadir has asked tell us more about the book you are working on about Sudan and the Mahdi era I'm assuming it, this is the one and the same thing yes it is the one and the same thing yes I'm uh, thank you for this uh, question yes I'm um, it, it's not going to be pub- this is not going to be published until um uh, probably 22 or something like that, or even 23. So that's still in the, in the far future. But um, it's set in the 19th century during the time of the the, 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 the Mahdi era and uh, Gordon. And it's all it's also about the colonialism. It, it's 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 going to show the events that led to the British invasion of, of Sudan. So there's there's a lot of history, but it's um, of, of of Sudan very much you know you're gonna there's African history um, and also um, Islam because uh, uh, Sudan was part of the Ottoman Empire mm. and uh, this um, uh, there was a revolt against the the, the, the Turkish rulers mm. and so th- there's a lot there's um, it's a lot of history involved so I'm excited about that yes awesome I cannot wait for that and I suppose the good thing is that we've got a, a wonderful backlist of books by you that we can all yes um, busy ourselves <laughs> with until that book is uh, released do you have a title for that book yet well I, the working title is Scorched uh, Rivers but I don't know whether that something usually uh, the title changes by the time the the publication comes through. Bird summons the working title was the Hoopy Hoopy, ah. and uh, yes, and uh, that's what it was called. And uh, then I realized, oh, not everybody knows what that is. Oh, yeah. So uh, I changed it to Bird Summons. Shall I tell you uh, something so interesting? While I was reading Bird yes. Summons, um, so I live in Yorkshire. While I was reading this, a, a news article was released that the hoopo had been a hoopo had been sighted in Leeds for the first time <laughs> in decades. I was what? like, Layla, what? Oh. <laughs> what have you conjured up? <laughs> you know? I was like looking outside because I live in front of some woods and I often see all sorts of wild birds, woodpeckers, everything. And I was, I've been looking out for this hoopo now. I'm like, listen, I need me a bird to come and talk to me. Just not transform me into anything. But yeah, what an amazing coincidence. eh? I was just like, that is amazing. That was lovely. It was like a perfect divine touch to my experience of reading your book. Oh, very nice. Yeah. (laughs) But thank you so much, Leila. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you. So much fun to get into this book a lot more with you and understand you know all of your motivations and thoughts behind it as well and I just simply cannot wait for the next book as well and I'm going to plug to everybody to read Bird Summons of course but also to read The Kindness of Enemies because that was an outstanding book I absolutely uh, loved that book it was just one of my favorites of this year and I know that not much is going to top it Um, thank you my pleasure and thank you to everybody for joining us and um, yeah I hope to see you all soon again and Leila I hope we I hope we can speak again when your next book comes out thank you so much that was really really nice of you thank you thank you everyone yeah okay bye bye